Good morning and welcome to New Community Church Online. My name is Natasha and I'm your ministry coordinator. We have a few announcements before we begin. First, if you have a prayer request or a financial need, we would love to help out in any way that we can. Just give us a call at 252-335-0015 and press extension 4. And lastly, if you call New Community your church home and you would like to set up online giving, simply click the link in the comments to get that set up today. Tonight 
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow.
everybody. Welcome to NCC Online. My name is Pastor Rob. I hope you're doing so great today. Um, hopefully we're getting closer and closer to the time when we can meet back in person as a church. Of course, if you're watching from out of town or uh, maybe you're a former NCC person, we're just glad you're tuning in and hopefully we can continue these videos even after uh, this pandemic is over, God willing. Uh, I'd like to start us off with a prayer this morning as we jump in. Lord, please meet with us today. Use me, speak through me, even me. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will permeate this place, this video, and just speak through my lips to the people today, whether this is uh, on Sunday morning at 10 all together, or whether it's someone watching it later in the week. We ask, Lord, you would do your thing, and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Before we get into the message, I want to give you a little bit of a prep. Today is Communion Sunday, which is really kind of cool, uh, awkward too, because it's virtual communion. But here's what I would ask you to do is just to get a little bit of a prep. Uh, all you need is something like a little piece of bread and uh, some kind of maybe a little, a little drink of juice uh, uh, or whatever you have. It's not really about the elements. And that for each person that you're watching with uh, after the sermon will be having a virtual communion. And remember that is for believers. So if you have children, make sure that they know Christ personally, maybe uh, older children, um, and for you, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus. We've been talking about barriers to belief. The series is, I want to believe, but. And that is a tough topic. It's for seekers. It's for those who are knocking on the door of Christianity. I want to believe, but there's so much in the way. There are these barriers. And we've, I think we've talked about some really big ones. Hopefully, God will, we've knocked down some big ones. But I also think it's for Christians, because even though we do believe, maybe we're one foot in, one foot out, we have these barriers too. And they can, at the very least, sort of stymie our faith. They slow us down. They keep us mired in disbelief just enough that we become ineffective. So I hope that you are leaning in, no matter how long you've been a Christian, to each of these messages. Week one, we talked about on-demand God. I want to believe, but on-demand God, He is fickle. He's capricious. He's there sometimes, but not all the times. He's not as quick as I want him to be. I'm impatient. He 
doesn't answer my prayers. I, I don't know where he is. And so I start to doubt his existence. And I get mad at him. And all of these things, and it becomes a barrier to my faith. Last week, we talked about killjoy God. I want to believe, but God is kind of a killjoy. He, he is there out to get me. He doesn't want me to have any fun. I have these things I want to do, and they're not compatible with Christianity. Well, that's true. But it isn't because God's a killjoy. It's because He loves us, and He wants to give us these joy parameters. And today, I want to talk about goosebumps God. That's right. Goosebumps God. I think you already know what I'm talking about. This is the touchy-feely God. This is the one we like. And there's a little part of this is real Christianity. Feelings and emotions are so critical to our faith. I hope you have them as part of your faith. But when we base our belief on our feelings, we get ourselves into trouble as well. And that's what we're talking about in Goosebumps God. Several years ago, I was sitting at Muddy's Coffee House having a, a brew with a friend, and we were having a serious conversation. And in that conversation, this person got real with me. They said, you know, Rob, uh, i got to be honest with you. At NCC, when we worship, I look around, and I see a lot of people are excited about worship. Some of them have their hands raised. They're, they're lifting their voices. And he said, I can see in the expression of their faces, they seem to be beaming with joy. They're smiling. They're feeling something. I talk to people, he said. I talk to my spouse, and she feels God's presence, but I never have. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible, but I also think I'm abnormal because I don't have these feelings that everybody else has. And then he asked this question, what's wrong with me? And that's a tough place to be. It's tough when everybody else seems to have the feelings associated with Christianity or worship or even being part of a service like this online or in person. But you're the person that doesn't have the feelings. And there's a couple of possibilities that are going on there. It's different for everybody. And I want to walk down through some of those issues and those possibilities of having a goosebumps version of God, having to demand that He is giving me proper emotions, that I feel Him, that I always sense Him. And to make it a little bit more memorable, I've made each of my main points a pop song from my younger years. That's right, because I can, and you're welcome. So let's dive right into those issues of Goosebumps God this morning. The first song is The Sign by Ace of Bass. How many people remember that song? Raise your hand. Okay, if you're older and wiser as I am, you not only remember it, but that was the song when I graduated from college. And once you heard it, you could not unhear it. It was like an earworm that got into your head, like the Macarena or something like that, and you just couldn't get rid of it. So I apologize if I just did that to you. I saw the sign, and it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. This, this song speaks to the goosebumps God of this morning, that people want to have a sign. We all do, whether you're a, an atheist, whether you're a complete skeptic or a scientist, or a Christian, or just a person. You want to have a sign. So many of us wish that, wow, could God just show up for a moment in my life today? Especially during COVID-19, these trying times, if you just give me a little bit of himself. Uh, not not uh, something subtle either. I mean, I, I really would like a big sign, a miracle, a billboard, a huge answer to prayer, and then I'll have my faith strengthened. And so we really desperately wish that we had more signs in our, in our lives. And, and if you feel that way, you're not alone. I think everybody does. This was something that the religious leaders of Jesus' day desired as well. Last week, we talked a lot about them. They're called the Pharisees, and they were often hypocritical. They were often out to get Jesus. And they came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, and I will look at that briefly. And they came to test him. And this is what happens in Matthew 12, 38. It says, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, said to Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So they make 
uh, no bones about it. They want to have a sign. They, they know Jesus has been doing some remarkable things. They come right to him. They don't mince any words. They say, Jesus, just give me the sign. And really, they're doing it because they want to test him. They don't believe that he can do it. And Jesus replies to them, verse 39, he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Ooh. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So his reply tells us a lot. There's two things you have to realize that are going on in this reply. The first is, if you read through the context there in Matthew 12, just prior, while the Pharisees are still present, right there with them, Jesus does, as usual, a remarkable miracle. You could say he has just done a tremendous sign. He has healed a demon-possessed person. And this demon-possessed man not only has a spiritual imprisonment, but he also, it says in the text, is mute and blind. He can't speak and he can't see. So he, his life is just completely diminished spiritually, physically, can't hear, can't see, can't even imagine that. Jesus heals him. He casts the demon out. He gives him the ability to speak. He gives them the ability to see right in front of all the Pharisees and all these people. And they have the nerve after this tremendous miracle to come to Jesus and say, hey, well, why don't you just give us a sign? What more sign do you want? Now, this is fascinating because after Jesus heals the demon-possessed person, rather than saying, that's good, Jesus, way to go. Wow, that was amazing. We, we now believe in you. They do the opposite. They say, you know, you must have done that by the power of Satan. In other words, they accuse Jesus of being a demon himself. Not only did he cast out the demon, but for some reason he's a demon that would do that. And they say, you must have gotten the power. So, one of the points that Jesus makes is a wicked and adulterous generation would do that. In other words, I just did something beautiful and you didn't believe. In fact, you just turned that on its head. But how could I possibly give you a sign that you would believe? Because if you're an unbelieving person, you're going to not believe. That's just the way it is. That's why the Bible says, when you seek me, you'll find me. Because you have to have an openness to Jesus. Otherwise, there's no sign that God could possibly give you. Maybe he's given you the sign already and you've overlooked it or, or, or maybe you've over-scienced it, over-rationalized it. Maybe you've just thought, well, it's just a coincidence as if there is such a thing. But really, it was God trying to get your attention, but you blamed it on something else. The second thing you need to know about this text is what is the sign of Jonah? So Jesus says, you're not going to get a sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that's important because what we know about Jonah, and Jesus tells us a little bit more, he starts to flesh this out, that what he's really saying is that Jonah was the prophet of Nineveh that ends up in the belly of a great fish. And when he does so, his life is ebbing away. He's, he's being digested. It must have been uh, awful. But God spares his life, has a plan for him, and allows the fish to spin him up into dry ground, and he lives, and in a way, he's resurrected. And Jesus said, that's the sign I'm going to give you. I am going to die on the cross, and I am going to be emptied of all of myself for you. I am going to be God in human form who dies for you, and then three days later, I'm going to resurrect from the dead. And that sign will be a permanent one, it will be an effective one for all who would believe would have eternal life. So I will give you a sign. Wait for it. It's coming soon. In fact, the Pharisees had a hand in it in killing Jesus, as we all did because of our sin. And that sign still is there alive and well for all of us, and we can see it indelibly imprinted upon creation in our hearts. The resounding truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead to give us new life and hope for a better life. This is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, God's people were always looking for signs throughout biblical history. 
And God would often give them what they needed. He didn't give them beyond what they needed. And I believe this is because, just as us today, He wants us to grow, be stretched. He wants us to walk by faith, not by sight. That's important. He doesn't want to just make it so easy that we're not really having faith. He wants the faith to be real, to be genuine. But unfortunately, we've also had this problem throughout history of having tremendous benefits and signs from God and just taking them completely for granted. Way back in ancient times, when God rescued his people, the Israelites, out of the bondage of the Egyptians, and he brought them out of that. They ended up wandering in the desert for 40 years because mostly because of their hard hearts and because they had bad attitudes and they were ungrateful and they weren't listening, they weren't obedient, even though God had done something tremendous. And he gave them this wonderful sign. His provision was manna from heaven. You can read that story. Manna is this sort of delectable honey bread that would have just melted in your mouth. And the people of, of God, they didn't have to gather. They didn't have to hunt. All they had to do was wake up in the morning, here's this bread from God. Talk about a sign, a powerful sign of God's provision. Could you imagine now, when I think about that story, I say, well, if I woke up this morning and, and God just delivered me some honey bread, I would have more faith. I would never have a doubt. Every day I wake up, here's honey bread. God is good all the time, right? Wouldn't you feel that way? Except we're no different from them. They eventually let the provision of God and the excitement and the emotions and the sign of manna wear off. And ultimately, they end up complaining. They said, we don't want this anymore. We're tired of it. We want, you know, eggs and bacon or whatever. Not literally, but we want something else for breakfast. And they, they just neglected God. And, and I think, that, again, we have to know our own hearts. We would do the same thing. We think we, if we had a sign from God, we would follow him better. But the reality is our hearts are our hearts. God can change them, and we can change them without a sign, and we should seek to do so. Let me ask you something today. If God gave you a sign right now, some miracle in your life, something that was supernatural, supernatural and undeniably true, would you believe in him more? Or would you find a way around what had happened? This is a difficulty of being human. Number two, second song is called Cold Hearted. Yes, I went there. This was from my high school graduation year, 1989, Paula Abdul. Now, you know Paula Abdul, but some of you may not know that once upon a time, she wrote hit songs. And People danced to them. They thought they were really good. Not really my thing. But this song was a classic 80s song, song in that it had tremendous lyrics. For example, he's a cold-hearted snake. I mean, that, there you go, right there. But she goes on to say this line, which I think is great. All the world's a candy store, and he's been trick-or-treating. I mean, come on. They just don't write music like that anymore. All the world's a candy store, and he's been trick-or-treating. Cold-heartedness is an issue when it comes to goosebumps God. For any reason, killjoy God, on-demand God, goosebumps God, or any other wrong view of God that we may accidentally ingest in our minds and our hearts, becomes significant in that we can grow cold. We can get callous in here, in our souls, in our minds. We can start to have negative thoughts about our Creator, subtle or overt. We can let this affect everything about us, our relationship with other people, for example. And little by little, not all at once, inch by inch, we become cold-hearted. We start to lose sight of God. And this can be a top reason why God feels distant. And I want to tell you right now, it's not God who moved. It's you or me. It's not God who ran away from you. It's you or me that ran away from God. And we do it, the Bible says, by becoming cold-hearted, or it might use the expression hard-hearted. Take a look at Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 9. It says, that is why the Holy Spirit says, today, when you hear His voice, 
Listen, church, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So the writer of Hebrews is going back to the very story I just talked about, the time of wandering in the desert after God raised them out of the Egyptians, and he was given the manna. He says, listen, today, don't harden your hearts. That's what they did. And oftentimes, that's what my people have done throughout the years. Even though I've provided for them, I've shown them signs, wonders, miracles, and ultimately, I've given them the sign of Jonah, which is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What more do you need? God asks his people. Instead, though, you harden your hearts. And when you get in that state, you don't hear from me, and you don't sense me, and you don't know me, but then worse, you blame me for it as if I did it. But the reality is, the Bible says it's you, it's us, it's people, the heart and the hearts. How can we do it? Well, there are many ways. I, I think the top one, of course, is unconfessed sin. Whenever we allow sin, not just normal sin, everybody sins and we confess it, but sin that is sort of ruling in our lives. There's a different kind of sin, the Bible says, that, rule, that leads to death, is, is dominating you. It may be an addiction, a problem, a, a sin area, just I keep falling into gossip. I try, but I just keep, I'm not giving it over to God. I keep falling over into pornography. I keep falling into lying. I keep falling into bad relationships. I keep falling I- into alcoholism, whatever it is, and I, it's dominating my life. That will start to make you hard-hearted. And this isn't always our problem with God. Sometimes it's, it's, it's other things, but sometimes it's, it's me. Sometimes it's that I've walked away from Him. One of the ways you can know that your heart has become hardened is your prayer life. If you aren't seeking God on a regular basis, if you no longer desire to pray to Him, or when you pray to Him, it's a memorized Prayer it might rhyme or something you learned as a kid, but there's no heart behind it. That's, that's not really a prayer at all. That may be an indication that your heart has become hardened. And today is the day to take a deeper look, be self-aware, allow God to expose any sin in your life. Lord, see if there's any way, wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting, especially as we prepare for the communion table. That's always right to see, Lord, what sinful act is in my life that I need to deal with today. You could know through your relationship with Scripture. The Bible is a living book. It's God's Word to us, and therefore, when our hearts are hard, we tend to neglect it. We put it on the shelf. We don't want to get too close. Maybe a meme or two on Facebook, but nothing more than that. Really, we need to dive into the Word each morning, at least for uh, some moments, some minutes, if not longer, and allow God to talk to us. And if you're not feeling that, I would encourage you to do it anyways until you start feeling it. Sort of fake it till you make it. And then finally, you can know that your heart is hardened by your relationship with other Christians. The Bible says very clearly, if you are hating your brother or sister, but you say you love God, you're a liar. Because you can't have it both ways. You're horizontal and your vertical relationships need to be intact, and it, it comes by having a right relationship with God, and that will spread out to others. And if I'm hating others, and, I, and I'm always mad at other Christians, and I don't like other Christians, it's because there's something wrong with my relationship with God. It's because my heart has become hardened. And so you can pray, and you can put that on the table. Number three, third song from the 80s is Faith by George Michael. Now, I'm not really sure what George Michael was singing about in this song, to be honest with you, but it made for a great point in the sermon because the chorus, at least, says, yes, I got to have faith, I got to have faith, I got to have faith, 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 got to have faith, 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 because they say the faith so many times that it gets my point across. And here's the point. Sometimes you got to have faith even if you're experiences, and your emotions are not keeping up to speed. This one's hard, but this is Christianity 101. 
It ultimately says, I come to God in faith, by His grace, receiving His love and care. And it doesn't matter if my emotions have caught up yet. Sometimes they're right there with me. And oh, aren't those wonderful times when not only in your mind and in your faith, your will, it's all aligned with God, but your emotions are with it too. Isn't that the best? I love that. God gave us those emotions. We can celebrate them. Or when you're singing a great worship song, maybe this morning with the team and the emotions are right there and you're also worshiping in spirit and truth, so great. But sometimes you just got to have faith even if the emotions aren't there. And that's okay. You can't control your emotions. They're fickle. They come and they go. You, you don't know when they're going to show up. But you shouldn't let that bother you. You shouldn't let that get you down or discourage you. You got to have faith. Now, there are many psalms that deal with this issue. In fact, you, you could almost argue that the book of psalms, many of them by King David himself, were written to show us how emotion intersects with our faith in a very powerful and profound way. David was a very emotional person. You can, we know a lot about David. You could read about his stories back in the Old Testament, but you can also see it in his psalms, these worship songs to God. Here's one example, Psalm 13, verse 1. David says, "'How long, Lord, will you forget me forever?' How long will you hide your face from me? Talk about agony. Talk about pain. And maybe you're right there with David this morning. And if you are, biblically, it's okay. He gives you permission. This is Scripture. To cry out to God. And David often did this. Psalm 13 is just one of many examples. Oh, Lord, I don't sense your presence right now. Where are you? Have you abandoned me? Where have you gone? And in a way, he's saying, I don't know if my emotions are keeping up with the facts of my faith. But he doesn't end there, and that's the great thing about the Psalms. They don't end in this place. They often start in this place. He continues on. You know, uh, for me, one of the most annoying things, I'm guessing I'm not alone, is when I text somebody. I get my phone out. I send them a message, especially if it's important, it's urgent, and I wait, and Hours later, no response. Isn't that the, like the worst? Uh, and then, you know, days later, I realized the person never responded. It's like, come on, you know, like today's uh, uh, day and age, you ought to respond to that text. And I don't give them the benefit of the doubt that they missed it or whatever. I just assume that they didn't respond. And when I send my wife something, I'm at the supermarket and I can't find the baked beans aisle and I text her and I'm like, hey, help me out. She's really slow about texting back. And I get a little impatient about that. And I start wondering, where is she? Is she, uh, you know, outside? Is she not near her phone? And why, why isn't she telling me what I, what I need to know? And I know that's my problem, not hers. And that's how it is with David in Psalm 13. It's almost like a text message to God. I, say, I, I send out a message, and it just went into the void. And I don't hear back. Of course, it goes back to that on-demand God. And I start wondering, maybe he's the killjoy God. And certainly it gets into today's topic. I think the goosebumps are gone. In fact, I have the opposite. I, I start to feel negative. I start to feel hurt. I start to feel abandoned. Where is God? But he continues. Verse 2, David says, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? This is important because when you're in a dark place, the very first thing you want to know is how long. And the good answer is not forever. We don't know how long. I couldn't tell you how long you're going to be in the tough place you might be in today. Or you can look back in your life and you say, boy, that was a really tough place. But I realize in hindsight, you know what, it, it, it ended. And I find that one of the most comforting promises of Scripture is that God will come through ultimately in the end, and no matter how bad I'm struggling, whether it be a physical health issue, whether it be a mental health issue, whether it be a spiritual issue, God will come through for me if I just remain faithful, if I just trust in Him. And it's just a matter of time. He will come through. Have hope today. It's just a matter of time. It might be right around the corner. You don't know. But he acknowledges two important things in this verse, David does. 
Conversely, the thoughts that he's having are emotional. That's an important understanding. He says, I wrestle with my thoughts, and day after day I have sorrow in my heart. That's his way of saying they're emotional. And I think that today is a day to underline the idea of emotion, that my emotion, when it's good, it's a God-given gift. When it's bad, I wish I could do away with it. But we have to have both. To have the good, you have to have the bad. And when that bad is there, acknowledge it. Say, you know what, this, I have to be honest about how I'm feeling. I can express it. I can tell someone. I can, I can cry out to God about it. He certainly will hear me. But also to understand that it's emotion. It's not the facts. It's my feeling. It's some degree my experience. And then secondly, in this verse, he acknowledges that his feelings are connected to his circumstances, and they always are. So he says, how long will my enemy triumph over me? So the reason why I'm feeling badly is because of my enemy, and in his case, a very real enemy who was trying to kill him. Now, ultimately, that passed in David's life, as these things do. But the emotions were so thick that he just couldn't see it. He couldn't feel it. But here's what he does. He presses on anyways. He keeps going anyways. And he concludes the psalm this way, verses 5 and 6. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Imagine it. No emotion. In fact, feeling sorrowful, negative emotion. My circumstances are bad. I'm crying out to God. I don't sense His presence. There's no goosebumps. But I trust you, God. I believe in your unfailing love. Now, New New Testament Christians today can say, and it's rooted in the sign of Jonah that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, hanged on a tree for me. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead. I trust you, Lord. You love me. You never let me down. And then I can go back to my memories. I will sing the Lord's praise, verse 6, for he has been good to me, even though I don't feel it right now, even though my experiences are bad, even though COVID-19 is horrible, even though I've missed some things, I've lost some things, I've lost people in my my life. Still, I know that God is good. And I know that he's good all the time. And I know that because of the word, but I also know it because of my faith, but I also know it because of my history, my past. I can look at my own history and says, yeah, but he's been good to me every time. He's never let me down. And you can even go beyond that and look at biblical history and say, look at what he's done in the life of his people. All the way back to these Israelites, look at how he raised them up out of their bondage. And even then, they threw their fists in the air at him, and he loved him anyways. He continued to show him grace and mercy all the way, of course, to Jesus on the cross. This is our God, and we can remember that. My last song, number four, is a fan favorite, even though millennials might uh, not agree. I don't know, but they know this song too, and it's Don't Stop Believing" by Journey. You knew that was going to come in here somewhere which says, don't stop believing, hold on to that feeling. And I'm not going to sing it for you because uh, this isn't the, a musical. This is not the TV show Glee or anything like that. It doesn't pop into a song. And, and plus, you don't really want to hear me sing it. Um, but I got to also spoil the song for those of you who love it because even though it's a nice sounding song, the chorus is false because it says, don't stop believing. We're off to a good start. Hold on to that feeling. And there we have a problem. You ever try to hold on to a feeling? Like, you know, where did it go? Feelings, they come and go quick. And when they're good feelings, that's a drag. Oh, I wish I could feel that way forever. You ever get that? Like when I first fell in love with my wife, Uh, I'm in love with her today as much as I always have been. And yet, the feelings ebb and flow, don't they, when you're in a a marriage relationship? I wish I could have those feelings of first love forever. But the reality is, you can't hold on to feelings. They they come and go. And when you try, you'll you'll get frustrated. And when you try with God, you know, I had that feeling 
when I sang that song, It Is Well With My Soul, and, and I just knew the presence of God. And maybe you did, by the way, and I'm not denying that. That's a beautiful thing. And it was so emotional. My eyes rolled up with tears, but this week, nothing, you know, and you might blame Ricky, or you might blame the preacher, or you might blame God. Where were you, God? Because I was there. But the reality is you can't hold on to those feelings. They, they come and go. But your faith doesn't come and go. Therefore, don't stop believing. And that really is the ending point of today's message as we head toward communion. Don't stop believing. Keep it up. Uh, there was a Carmelite monk hundreds of years ago who talked about, wrote about the dark night of the soul. You might have heard that expression. He coined that phrase. And this monk had went through that, and he wrote about it. And uh, turns out it was quite universal for many of God's servants. Maybe if you've been a Christian for a while, you've experienced it. I believe I have, and thankfully only once, and it lasted for just a short time. It lasted for three days, which felt very, very painful. Because what a dark night of the soul is really is when you feel completely distant from God. That's really what, it's, what it is. It's when you feel like God isn't there. Your emotions go out the window positively, and they're just, you just start to doubt everything. And I'm not a doubter. In fact, God just equipped me with faith. I give him all the credit. So thankful this only happened once, and it was tied to negative circumstances. It was tied to negative emotions. I felt like God hadn't come through for me in something really big in my life. And I felt like he had clearly said that he was going to. And of course, ultimately he did, and he did it big time, and it's a great story. But in that moment, I just felt like, Lord, where are you? And I went into the worst funk. I just cocooned myself for three days. And I just felt sorry for myself. And I thought, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Where are you, God? And this is the dark night of the soul. And if you haven't experienced it, you might still to come. So better to prepare yourself to know that that's real. And maybe it's God-given. And that's the point, point of, the, of the Carmelite monk's message is that ultimately he discovered that the dark night of the soul actually was a gift from God. Wow, it's hard to acknowledge that, that, that that could be a gift, but it was the very thing that God used to soften his heart, to make him more tender toward the things of God, more compassionate, more loving and to be more grateful of God's presence. Maybe the dark night of the soul was the very thing I needed to see God's amazing power, His breakthrough in my life. And when you experience distance from God, when He's not there, when the emotions aren't high, when you are feeling negative, when you're like David in the Psalms, where are you, God? Realize it may actually be a gift from God to you. It may be His way of putting you right where he wants you to be in utter dependence without the, the, the frills, without the emotions. And that's when you really want to hang on to your faith, not the feeling. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that faith in God. I'd like to pray for you today and all of us that we would be able to do just that. I'm so excited about what God can do. And he can do this, even if we're not meeting in person today virtually. He can make this breakthrough in your heart. That's the great thing about our God, the great thing about His church. We're His people no matter where we are. He can do the profound, powerful work in your life today that He wants to do in and mine. And as we gear up for communion again, we're going to have in just a couple minutes, Ricky's going to play an awesome song for us to prepare our hearts. Hope that you don't just turn this video off right now, that you, if you're a Christ follower, you continue on. Just take a few minutes and really be prayerful in these moments that God would just come to your heart and He would expose any sin that you need to confess to Him and that you would be right there, that He'd be right there with, with you. And even if you don't experience that in an emotional way, you will know based on fact, based on faith that He is there. He loves you. He died for you. He rose from the dead. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do want to pray for all of our people at NCC and all the people listening in, all the people affiliated with our church, or even if they're just seeking today, I'm so glad they're leaning in. Lord, meet each one right where he or she is at. Help to fill with your Holy Spirit those who will call on you 
and sense your presence and pleasure. We pray that, Lord, if it's your will, you would take away the pain. You would bring positive emotion. You will restore each person out of the darkness that's in the darkness. But, Lord, while they're there, may they not miss the experience that you are trying to give them, the message, the teaching of suffering that is so in line with the way of Christ, that you suffered for us, you died for us on the cross, but you didn't leave it there. We always end with the amazing power of the resurrection, giving us hope and victory. And as we have these elements now, the bread, the cup, may you be in this time, even though we're scattered around, may you be uniting our hearts with yours, Jesus Christ, and what you did. Help us to remember your death, burial, and resurrection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So church, as we come to the time where we're going to take communion together, I wanted to share this song with you. It's by one of my favorite Christian artists. His name is Zach Williams. This song is called To the Table. And it basically says that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, there's nothing that God hasn't seen. And all you have to do is return to the table. So we're going to take a couple minutes and we're going to prepare our hearts to come to the table of Christ. And I'm going to play for just a few seconds here. And I want us to pray together that God would clear our minds, clear our hearts to be able to receive communion together.
prepare for communion that you would accept us as we are and we know that you will God I pray that you speak to people this morning and you would tell them that it's okay that they have sorrows and they have sadness it's okay that they've been through trials all they have to do is return to your table I pray that you would put that on somebody's heart this morning, God. And as we prepare to remember you and the sacrifice that you made for us this morning, God, I pray that it wouldn't get away from us how huge that sacrifice really was when you sent your precious son to die for us on the cross. God, we love you and we praise you. In your precious son's name, amen. Thank you, Ricky. We appreciate that. As we enter into the elements now, again, if you're at home, just uh, something to be a piece of bread and, and some form of, of juice or drink. But we know it's, it, as we said, it's really about the remembrance. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. On the night before he died, he was with his disciples and he took the bread. And let's all take this together. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On that same night, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, as we are joined together as a church family committed to Jesus Christ, we do remember that moment in time where Jesus suffered and bled and died for us. And we also remember with great fondness and joy the power of your life raising him from the dead that we might rejoice forevermore and have the promise of resurrection ourselves. And right now that promise seems as relevant as other, ever that we would come out of death once and for all, the people of God, with new bodies and restored souls to live forever in eternity with you. We give you all the praise today and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all the will sing how great how great is our God and age to age he stands and time
Thanks again for spending some time with us today. We hope that you join us again next Sunday, uh, 10 a.m., same place, same time for, for Mother's Day. We've got a special message hopefully planned just for you, and, and we're just relying on God during this time. Uh, also, check out newcommunity.church. Again, we've mentioned that you can give online there and, and set up recurring giving. Uh, and also, like us on Facebook if you haven't already so that you can follow all of the activities and when we're going to meet in person again. That's most likely where you'll find out first. Have a great day.